Is saying the spice must flow a bit too corny at this point? Hello and welcome back to my channel. Bonsoir et re bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Muriel and it's time. It is finally time for my review of the Doom Chronicles by Frank Herbert. So, it's been a hot minute since I've actually finished the very last Dune book. I read all of the six Dune books published by Frank Herbert during the months of November and December. It was quite an experience, a very inconsistent one as well, the most inconsistent one in fact I've ever had with an SFF series of books. But uh, I have a lot of things to say about it and I'll try not to be too redundant with what I've already said in my review for the very first book of the Duneverse, which is titled Dune. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> my rat review of God Emperor of Dune. So uh, sit tight, take a, I don't know, hot beverage, whatever, and uh, let's do this. So if you're watching this, you all already kind of know the premise of Dune, at least, and probably the Duneverse in general, right? I'm not going to go over that again. So I'm going to jump straight into the writing and how it evolved or not throughout the series. Personally, I think that the writing actually did get slightly better over time. So I had complained in my review for Dune that there were these weird bits of dialogue or no, like interior monologue, just characters sighing for like seven R's and H's with lots of brackets. And I was like, that's weird. It's super clunky to read. But that kind of went away, though it did pop its head up again in like Heretics and Chapter House Dune. So it's like, no, why are you doing this again? <laughs> it was really weird. Otherwise, no, I think the writing actually got a tad bit better, though overall the style remained fairly the same. I mean, that makes sense. I'm still Frank Herbert writing the books. One thing which was very bad and which got worse <laughs> with time was the sex writing. Well, I mean, generally the writing about gender dynamics and just the sex scenes, oh, they were bad. I wish I had my copies of Heretics and Chapter House with me to show you all the little uh, note sticky things <laughs> that I put in to underline like every cringy sex passage. It was just straight up bad. I'm sorry, but like, I wanted him to stop. Just please stop, mate. I don't want to read this shit anymore. When it came to the like the philosophizing and political writing as such, it was excellent in the original Dune trilogy. I maintain that. It was largely redundant by the time of God Emperor. And then when I got around to Heretics and Chapter House, and Heretics, there wasn't that much of it overall. In Chapter House, it made somewhat of a comeback. And there were a couple of paragraphs that I found interesting about democracy. But then I also noticed that he basically copy-pasted stuff. He'd written in, like, God Emperor or one of the previous books. I'm like, dude, that's just lazy. Come on, you're just repeating yourself at this point. So, again, a bit annoying. Structurally speaking, I did enjoy that Every single Dune book has multiple points of view. God Emperor is, I mean, mostly focused on Leto the Second Atreides, which I do not care for. And, I mean, generally speaking, you get a crap ton of Atreides and Heretics and Chapter House. But you do have several points of view, and I tend to prefer stories that have multiple points of view. And one thing I just kept enjoying, and which I generally enjoy in these types of works, is that each chapter is basically headed by an extract from like a textbook or an archive or, I don't know, a speech that's from either the future or the past, and it just fleshes out the world building. And I like that formula. I found this in The Left Hand of Darkness by S. K. Le Guin, but I mean, I've seen it across different types of SFF books and I always tend to enjoy that actually. Some people might find it a bit info dumpy, but I don't know, it works for me. Delving a bit more deeply into the structure of the series proper. Well, so I've already stated, I think, in my rant review of God Emperor that the first three Dune books were conceptualized and written as basically a self-contained trilogy. They do have basically one main story arc, which is that of Paul Atreides and his descendants, and also, I mean, his mother and the people in his household. And that is pretty much a self-contained story. Then you've got Heretics and Chapter House, and there should have been a third book that would have made also another self-contained trilogy. And I mean, Chapter House Dune is 
very obviously a direct sequel to Heretics with overall the same cast of characters. And I even argue that, honestly, Heretics and Chapter House could have been condensed in a single novel because the pacing was wonky and some things were a bit redundant overall. The first Dune trilogy is basically Paul Trady's story, I mean, and that of his descendants. I will note, though, that even though the first trilogy is what I favoured out of the entire Dune first saga, the pacing of the trilogy as a whole is a bit strange when you think about it, because the first Dune book is really freaking chunky. Then you've got Dune Messiah, which is like the shortest of all six books. And then Children of Dune is a bit chunkier again. And I don't know, Dune Messiah feels like an addendum to the first Dune book, but at the same time, it is its own story. It completes Paul Modib's arc and, I mean, adds very important information with regards to the theming about, like, messianic figures and political leaders, etc. But then you've got <laughs> Children of Dune, which takes place several years afterwards. I mean, Dune Messiah takes place several years after Dune, and Children of Dune takes place several years after Dune Messiah. And it's a weird shifting of gears, I guess. It's relatively minor, mind you, but when I think about it, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit weird the way it was cut up like that. Then God Emperor of Dune, which I did not like at all. I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it. It's basically an essay masquerading as fiction. Sue me. I said it. I'm sorry, that's my opinion. It's very dialogue heavy. Almost nothing happens. It's just freaking Leto the second philosophizing about shit for 10 pages at a time. And I stand by that. And Duncan Idaho being Duncan Idaho, being resurrected ad nauseum, and falling into a weird, cringy love triangle with Leto the second and Queen Ari, and I'm not going to go over that again because it's just going to make me mad. And then you've got Heretics and Chapter House and that third one that never came out, which is basically more about Benny Jesuit, actually. It does take a very close look at their ranks, their functioning, and the main characters are Benny Jesuit sisters. And that I liked. I liked learning more about the Benny Jesuit and got interactions with the Tleilaxu especially. So it is a bit different. It does take a different turn and explores different aspects of Frank Herbert's world. So that I enjoyed. So... <laughs> Like I said, the crap ton of Atreides' descendants in those two books to a point where I'm like, it kind of breaks genetics in a way and that annoyed me at that as well. As I've stated before, the pacing was just wonky as hell. The two novels could have been condensed into one. A lot of stuff could have been cut back, honestly, because the long stretches of both books where pretty much nothing happens. A step up from God Emperor most definitely, but did not rise to the excellence of the first Dune trilogy. Then we have the character work. Here, I felt that it got worse over time, actually. And that was really, really disappointing because I did think it was actually pretty good in the first Dune trilogy, especially for, like, all the science fiction science fantasy, I'll allow it. <laughs> so, yeah, it was uneven and got worse over time. Even in the first trilogy, though, but I stated this in my original Dune review, sometimes you do feel like the characters are like mouthpieces for Frank Herbert's philosophizing, which you know, it's fine. It wasn't overwhelming either, so, you know, I didn't mind so much. But this does get worse over time. And obviously the worst example of this is clearly God Emperor of Dune. That, like I said, it's straight up an essay masquerading this vision, I think. I felt that the characters got a bit recycled over time and became set pieces more than anything else, and that their flashing out as individuals got increasingly superficial. So yeah, it was disappointing. And... Like I said, just too many freaking Atreides. But that goes more to the world building, I guess, than anything else. And, and the sciencey elements of Dune, it broke genetics. I'm sorry, but there's just no way you can actually trace lineage like that over thousands of years because genetic trees just collapse at some point and everyone is everyone's descendant. It makes no sense to say that 5,000 years after Paul Mujib's death, you've still got his descendants as such. I mean, I guess maybe at the time Frank Herbert didn't know so much about how genetics work, but from a modern reader's point of view, from someone who's studied a bit of genetics at university, it broke genetics. It didn't make any sense. I was like, I'm sorry, but it makes no sense to say these are Atreides anymore. Like, no. Despite this, though, I mean, some characters do shine through. I mean, to me, the best ones are basically in, well, the first Dune trilogy, though they are fairly great characters. I mean, yeah, they were great characters before great characters became the hot thing in SFF, basically. And they definitely stand out and have their own personalities, like Paul Mudib, Aaliyah, Lady Jessica, Duncan Idaho, 
Okay, let's talk about Duncan Idaho specifically just for a minute. There's too much Duncan Idaho. There's too much Atreides. And then there's too much bloody Duncan Idaho's. <laughs> He's like the narrative thread that connects all of the Doom books of all characters. And see, the thing that's most aggravating is that I learned that basically Frank Herbert kept shoving in Duncan Idaho as freaking fan service because his readers really freaking love that relatively initially minor character so he decided i'm gonna make him a gola and bring him back just forever he does get more central and more active as a player in the story in later books notably heretics and chapter house and he's a more interesting character by then but i'm like really you're gonna just keep resurrecting freaking duncan idaho okay but i mean it did in fact start out as fan service which i'm like that loses my respect just a wee bit and finally i'm just gonna touch quickly on character relationships specifically romantic and sexual relationships it went from there so i had complained well, i mean it wasn't really a complaint but i didn't think paul and charney's or cheney's relationship was that convincing i thought it was a bit insta lovey at least in doom then i guess yeah you kind of just go along with it in doom messiah but um the romance just gets very 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 bad from that point onwards and the sex is atrocious in god emperor the romance between Leto II, aka the Wereworm, and Queen Ari was absolutely ridiculous and cringy, and I didn't want to see any of it. Wow, that was bad, and this is really freaking love triangle with Duncan Idaho. And then in Heretics and Chapter House, so you've got the Benny Jesuit doing stuff with sexuality, and then you've got the Honored Martres doing stuff with sexuality, and it's just bad. And it's just bad. I did like the character of Odraid, speaking of characters that, you know, shone through and Miles Tag, like they were reasonably well fleshed out characters. Okay, I'll give those books that. But the romance elements, the sex elements, Mabella and Duncan Idaho, just no, stop. I don't want to see this anymore. Not interested. <laughs> so yeah, a bit disappointing overall that it just kind of went downhill. I mean, it really fell off a cliff with God Emperor, then just rose up a bit again in Heretics and Chapter House. But overall, yeah, it was a downward trajectory for the character work. And then this time around, I'm going to switch it up a bit. I'm going to talk about the themes first before the world building. There are a crap ton of themes in the Doom Chronicles. I will give that series that. And there is some brilliant top tier theming at that as well, especially in the first trilogy, once again. First theme is obviously politics. More specifically, Frank Herbert took a close look at autocracy, how harmful it is. The threat posed by charismatic leaders. I think he quipped the saying that charismatic leaders should come with a warning label, maybe bad for your health or something like that. And yeah, I mean, basically that's the whole point of Paul Atreides' story, right? Messianic figures, charismatic leaders are smoke and mirrors most of the time. Even if they do start out with good intentions, when you get that much power, it's inevitably going to affect you and force you to do very trashy things. You also said, and I think that's very true, that it's not so much that power corrupts people, the power attracts corruptible people. I think that's probably a more accurate way of putting it, and I definitely agree with that. And all of the books kind of explore that theme. The greatest example of that, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> Leader the Second Trade is the God Emperor. I mean, I stated this in my rant review. Yeah, he says he wants to lead humanity along the Golden Path, and I'll get back to that freaking Golden Path, and ensure its survival, etc. But at the end of the day, I just thought he sounded like a freaking predator. And he calls himself a predator. Not in that sense, but anyway, and just tries to justify abusive behavior, not just on individuals, but in types of people. So I was just like, fuck you, mate, I don't care. So yeah, charismatic leaders are bad. Autocracy is bad. It leads to chaos. It leads to violence. It leads to corruption. It leads the individual who is the charismatic leader, if that person starts out as a decent person, it leads them to kind of loathing themselves and loathing what they feel they have to do to maintain order and control. And that was brilliantly explained explored, most definitely. Following on from that, you have the intertwining of politics and religion, obviously. But I mean, I talked about politics separately, but ultimately, those themes go hand in hand in the Dune Chronicles. Politics and religion, because both, I mean, depending on the political system, of course, and depending on the religious system, of course, but often enough, especially with, well, monotheistic religions, which you get descendants of in the Dune Chronicles, and with 
autocratic power structures, which you get forms of in the Doom Chronicles. It's about controlling people. It's about ensuring the ones at the top stay at the top at all costs. And even if you want to get to the top to help the people at the bottom, what are you going to have to do to bring those people up? Because you still need to stay in power to make sure other top people don't take your place, so they don't do bad things, etc. That's the whole thing with the Trades and the Harkonnens. The Harkonnens are supposed to be so, so bad. But then Paul Trades starts a freaking jihad that apparently kills billions of people across different planets. So, like, again, <laughs> the road to hell is paved with good intentions, especially when it comes to autocratic systems of power, whether it's purely secular, whether it's religious, whether it's a blend of both. So, yeah, corruption, exploiting the masses, masses which are perhaps more ignorant and kept ignorant so they are more exploitable all of the parallels between both the institutions of religion and priesthood and the institutions of autocratic power with a monarch or a duke or a baron etc or you know an emperor and then the ultimate incarnation of the two being the freaking god emperor Leto the second Atreides who supposedly has good intentions but still I maintain he was a massive asshole despite all this however I do think there's also maybe the idea that such institutions are necessary at times, they shouldn't devolve into terrible authoritarian systems that just crush people into the dirt, a la 1984. But sometimes you do need a strong leader or you need a religious institution to inspire hope in people. I mean, sometimes people just have faith and then faith gets organized into religion. Not all religions have to be evil and crushing. Not all political systems have to be corrupted and venal and anti-democratic or against the people they're supposed to serve. There is a certain necessity for at least some level of order and organization, but it can easily slip into dumpster fires, basically. <laughs> How it's spread out through the books, I would say most of the heavy theming regarding politics, religion, and the intertwining of the two is done in the first Dune trilogy. Then, I mean, in God Emperor, it's also explored, but then I think it's done in a way that's just freaking overkill and redundant. Then it's toned down a bit in Heretics and Chapter House. So in Chapter House, it did pop its head up again, especially regarding democracy and the organization of the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood, which was very interesting, and I did enjoy that. A third theme would be ecology and ecological balance. The idea that human beings are in a relationship with their environment and with other life forms. Now, I did say in my original Doom review that one thing I didn't quite like, which is something I never like in fiction, or in non-fiction by the way, is that there was a bit of human exceptionalism going on. But otherwise, I did feel that Frank Herbert had a good grasp on ecology, the necessity for harmonious relationships between human beings and the rest of the natural world. And I loved the way this relationship between human beings and their environment was explored through the Fremen on Arrakis slash Doom. This interrelationship between culture and ecology was just brilliantly realized and explored in the first Dune trilogy, how it shapes human evolution, human resilience, human spiritual systems as well, because clearly the faith of the Fremen has roots that go back before they arrived on Arrakis, but then it's also shaped by the experience of living in a very, very harsh desert that has bloody sandworms swimming around in it. Then you kind of contrast this to the hyper-technological societies of the Ixians and the Tleilaxu, who are doing some questionable things with technology, Ixians tinkering around with what would be close to AI and like hard tech with machines, and then the Tleilax are doing some weird shit with like genetic engineering and reading. And I do think, I mean, that's the vibe I got, that Frank Herbert was frowning upon those cultures through the Bene Gesserit. The Bene Gesserit criticized those cultures very harshly, and they tried to maintain a type of balance. I'm not sure they're always really quite doing that and I mean they do have aspirations of power and maintaining power. I mean, they say they serve the people and they want to ensure the survival of humankind and the betterment of humankind, but sometimes it's a bit questionable because they're still, at the end of the day, human beings, though... I'll get back to that. So yeah, the ecological theming. Mostly in the first Dune trilogy, a smidge of it came back in Chapter House Dune. Then, not entirely divorced from what I just said about ecology and the relationship between humans and nature, you have, well, I guess the impact of superhuman abilities, or I mean, humans 
enhancing themselves with technology, whether it be hard tech with machines or, well, bioengineering, really, and selective breeding. The Duneverse doesn't have aliens as such, but you do get very weird, highly specialized humans, the people who navigate the ships from the Navigator's Guild hardly look human anymore. They're like big, fat blobs with fins and flat faces floating around in melange gas all the time. You've got the Benny Tleilax who kind of look like elfish vampires. <laughs> and even the Benny Gesserit have these amazing abilities to regulate their body temperatures, their pH, their emotions, and can do stuff with martial arts-like things that are just almost superhuman. How does that affect human society and the way you relate to your fellow human beings? Especially when it comes to freaking prescience. Because, I mean, that's the thing that crops up again and again in these series. Paul Mudib is the Kwisatz Haderach awaited for generations, and so he's prescient and can see the future, or one of many futures, presumably. How the hell do you relate to your fellow humans when you're, you're that above the rest of them? And that, again, loops back around to politics and religion and power, because being prescient is almost being godlike, and oh, guess what? We get a god emperor called the Legion of the Second Atreides. That's bound to mess with your head and with your conceptualization of your own place within humanity. I mean, the Betty Jesuit at some point straight up admit that they're barely human anymore because they have these amazing abilities and have done selective breeding for so many freaking generations that they're almost diverging from the base homo sapiens, I guess. Add to that, if you have good intentions, but you do have these superhuman abilities, you might also start getting these ideas that, well, I can use them for the betterment of humanity, which is the whole deal of the Benny Jesuit, and it's kind of the deal of Paul Mudib as well. But then you kind of see where that leads. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't think there's a clear hard judgment in either direction. Perhaps it's slightly more negative than positive, though. I think Frank Herbert presents the possibilities of such things happening. They don't necessarily have to be bad, but they can easily be corrupted like everything else about human beings, really. And I said this is linked to the theme of ecology because then already starts out with this idea that humans are kind of above the rest of living organisms. The Bene Gesserit make a distinction between people and human beings, people being like the masses and human beings being exceptional individuals. And then so doesn't this cut you, not only from your fellow human beings, but from your fellow life forms if you're so above everything else? It's not really that surprising that you get a god complex really in the end. So yeah. All these questions are floating around. I think there are hard answers, like I said, maybe nudges in certain directions, but ultimately it leaves you with a lot of food for thought. Uh, you want to figure it out for yourself. And the final theme I will touch upon, which once again just kind of blends in with what I just talked about with superhuman abilities and balanced relationships between human beings and their environment, their fellow life forms, you've got the concept of human evolution. More specifically, controlled human evolution. Let's be real here, the Duneverse is rife with eugenics. People think that eugenics are unequivocally bad. I don't quite believe that person. I don't think it's right to sterilize people against their will. I don't think it's right to force people to breed against their will. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying eugenics at its most basic definition just means actively selecting for good, useful traits. It's just that throughout history it's been used to do very bad things and that's shit. We all agree on that. So basically that's what's going on in Dune. And the Duneverse is eugenics on extremely grand scales and the ones orchestrating all of that are the Bene Gesserit. Though the Benny Trilax are doing this as well, though they're adding a layer to that with bioengineering and genetic engineering and their freaking axolotl tanks, which are freaking horrible, because axolotl tanks are actually the female Benny Trilax, or what's left of them. They're just wounds that can do genetic engineering. So, brilliant example of misogyny. Not condone misogyny, but it's, it's highly criticized in the book, so I don't have an issue with that, but yeah, the Benny Trilax are fucked in the head. So, controlled evolution. See, that's a theme, actually, I did mention in my review for Ringworld because you've got the Pearson's puppeteers kind of doing that but to other species and I thought that was interesting. Here it's the Bane Jesuit doing it to their fellow human beings, selecting the best of the best and making sure that their genes are passed along and traits are selected and reinforced throughout the generations and so you end up having a shit ton of Atreides with certain traits and like I said that kind of starts breaking genetics at a certain point but all right. So this obviously brings up the question of bettering humanity on the one hand, but also limiting fuel and agency on the other. Because, I mean, 
in the Bene Gesserit order, the women are all expected to breed and have X amount of children and pass on their genetic lines and genetic memories. And they manipulate people around them to show that they will have children. I mean, the prime example of this is, of course, Paul Atreides, because they wanted their freaking Kwisatz Haraq, but <laughs> look where that got them. So maybe it's not always a good idea. So this, to me, gets back to human hubris playing at being gods. And fair enough, a lot of individuals in the Duneverse are quite godlike. I'll give you that. But we are not gods. And since there's a lot of philosophizing about religion, but also faith and spirituality as well in general, and there are lots of beautiful passages about our connections to the wider universe and the matrix of energy and being, etc. So I wouldn't say it's a, like an atheist series at all. There's a lot of spiritual content whilst it criticizes religious institutions. But we're not gods. We're not gods. And even if the technology of the peoples of Dune are extremely advanced, they're still playing at being gods, and that can backfire fire majorly and just punch them in their faces. Even the Bene Gesserit, even if they're supposed to be the good guys. Well, I'll get back to that. They're bettering humanity, but I mean, are they really? There's still a shit ton of people living in crap conditions on several planets, and they're just focusing on a few different lines. See, but that just goes back to the world building, and Frank Herbert's, I guess, grasp of scientific concepts, or at least the scientific concepts he wanted to inject in his book series. He's breaking genetics. I'm sorry, it's just, it doesn't work that way. And there's a lot of, like, social Darwinism going on, and they're selecting psychological traits. But I'm like, that's just not how Darwinian evolution works. At times I thought he was going off of like Lamarckian evolutionary theory which has been kind of disproved and like you can acquire traits during your life and then you'll pass it on to your descendants. That's just not, not how it works. He's breaking genetics. He's breaking Darwinian evolutionary theory. So I mean as someone who has studied a bit of science and enjoys somewhat solid scientific elements in her science fiction, that bothered me. It's an interesting theme. Its execution, however, had some serious flaws. And finally, I'll just add, but I'm, I'm going to get into detail in just a minute. It also means that, especially in Heretics and Chapter House, there's a lot of focusing on heterosexual sex, and that gives rise to those cringy sex scenes and the obsession with the honored martyrs and the many Jesuit fucking guys and having their babies and like oh please stop stop just just kill me now but as a result this brings me to the feminist question for dune as i stated in my rant review for god emperor i have seen i guess a couple of posts on reddit and elsewhere asking the question, why hasn't the feminist movement adopted Dune, or, oh, Dune is so feminist, it's got so many powerful female characters, and the Ben Gesserit, blah blah. Let's address this question head on. Is Dune, in my opinion, of course, feminist? No, it isn't. It really isn't. That being said, I don't think it's anti-feminist, I don't think it's misogynistic as such, though I will reiterate I do think God Emperor displays elements that get close to misogyny, elements that get close to homophobia, and they made me uncomfortable. Or at least, I mean, I felt they were, for one thing, completely unnecessary and irrelevant. And second, I kind of felt they came out of left field somewhat, and they were weird and didn't really fit in with the rest of the themes and the conversations going on in the book. Now, in Heretics and Chapter House, you do focus in on the Bene Gesserit, so obviously sexual politics finally come to the fore. Originally, I had thought that one thing that was slightly missing from the original Dune trilogy were sexual politics and the implications of sexual oppression and gender in politics and religion. I mean, you did have a few crumbs here and there, but I felt that would have elevated it even further. You do get sexual politics from God Emperor onwards, and especially in Heretics and Chapter House, but those sexual politics, like I said in my rant review and I think my December reading wrap-up, they were done awfully. I mean, it was bad. It was just straight up bad. At times, Frank Herbert kind of almost gets close to feminist theory and then deviates and goes in his own direction because he does describe mechanisms that are discussed in feminist theory about the origins of 
women being treated as inferiors, etc. But then there's so much focus on breeding and heterosexual sex through the Benny Gesserit and then through the conflict with the honored martyrs that was a bit, and eh, no. No, what are you doing there, mate? That's just bad. And the sex was just plain bad, as I've said numerous times by now. And I'll add to this general comment a specific note on said Benny Jesuit, because that's kind of the focal point of the discussion of feminism around Dune, or at least that's my impression, that, well, the world is basically shadow-controlled by the Bene Gesserit. They're the ones orchestrating these extensive breeding programs throughout the centuries. They bring about the Kwisatz Haraq. Then that kind of bites them in the ass in the end. So I'm like, okay. Yeah, they control and manipulate everything and they endure despite all odds and all adversities. And they're badass. Yes, much is made about badass female characters. And I observed this about A Song of Ice and Fire slash Game of Thrones as well. Here's the thing though. Just because you have badass female characters does not mean you're actually promoting equality between the sexes, fighting gender stereotypes, or promoting feminist ideas of female liberation from sex-based oppression, and I would even add male liberation from sex-based gender discrimination, etc. That's the thing. It is not a sufficient condition for a work to be feminist just to have badass female characters. Not to mention that the Bene Gesserit, or at least one of them, I can't remember if it was Odraid or Taradza who says this, but they mentioned that they consider themselves to be barely human. So I'm like, at best you've got exo-feminism, uh, alien feminism, I don't know. They consider themselves to be barely human, so how's that relevant to, well, female humans and women and women's rights? How's that relevant? They're so different with their superhuman capabilities and their ability to manipulate everyone and to share genetic memories, but I'll come back to that. They're, I guess, supposed to be the grey, mind you, good guys, but they do some ethically questionable shit. I mean, the way they manipulate everything around them, the way they orchestrate reading without really consulting the people directly concerned by this, is that really a good thing? Does this portray women in a positive or at least neutral light? I mean, they don't have to be portrayed in a positive light, but I don't know. I kind of question at times whether they're really supposed to be the good guys. But then Frank Herbert introduces the Honored Martries in Heretics and Chapter House Doom. And that's where it gets really just all over the place, because presumably the Bene Gesserit use their sexuality and their feminine wiles to control men, manipulate men, eventually breed with them. And you have the honored matres who focus in even more on sex and sexual manipulation and sexual enslavement of men. And it's always men, mind you, not other women, because I guess their sexual techniques are reserved for heterosexuality. So there's a clear... Well, I mean, no, it's not clear at all, but presumably there's a divide between the right kind of female sexuality and the bad kind of female sexuality. Unbridled passion and bridled sexuality is the domain of the honored matres, and the honored matres are described as being evil, power-hungry whores. Do you see the problem here? <laughs> Moreover, the Bene Gesserit are wary of strong emotions and love. They're allowed to feel different things, but they have to control their emotions, and love is prohibited. Again, how's that relevant to the average woman as a human being who presumably has access to the whole wide spectrum of human emotions? Love is bad. So again, is that really the ideal vehicle to discuss feminist ideas or to present women as just fellow human beings to men? Methinks not really. <laughs> and finally, you've got the Kwisatz Haderach, who has to be male, because for some bloody reason, females cannot access the genetic memories of their fathers, but the whole thing about genetic memories, whilst interesting, wasn't always that well realized, in my opinion. But okay, I'll get back to that in a second. It's not overtly anti-feminist. I don't think it's overtly misogynistic either. Like, there's no trashing of women or treating them like garbage or saying they should absolutely stay in the kitchen and in the bedroom. There's none of that. They're great, or at least very interesting, Maury Gray female characters. I will give Frank Herbert that. But his books are not specifically feminist in any meaningful way. And that's fine. It doesn't have to be. As I've said it before, it doesn't have to be. Not everything I read or watch or listen to has to be feminist. Or, I mean, 
concerned with feminist theory, so that's fine. But I will definitely contest anyone who says that the Duneverse is a feminist series of works of science fiction. Like, no, <laughs> they're not. And at times it does actually veer into slightly misogynistic slash homophobic territory. So yeah, those are my thoughts on that particular subtopic. Now I shall talk about the world building. So to me, the world building is the most consistent and well realized in the first Dune trilogy. But I mean, I think you've gathered by now that the running theme here is I think the original Dune trilogy is the best of all the books. <laughs> the world building was superb. The development of the ecology of Arrakis, the relationship between the Fremen and their own planet, and the way the political landscape is described, and also the different civilizations with the Landsrad, the Ixian the Tleilaxu, the Bene Gesserit, though you get a lot more of the Bene Gesserit themselves in Heretics and Chapter House. Then you have God Emperor of Dune. To me, as I stated before in my rant review, there was a big problem with the time scale during which the events of the God Emperor's tenure take place in a way, because civilization has become unbelievably homogenized. Family structures are described by the Bene Gesserit archivists to be the same everywhere and to have been the same everywhere for thousands of years. And I'm like, even with the God Emperor and his army of fish speakers, I don't really see how that would be possible. Because think about how our human civilizations have changed and gone through upheavals in the span of like 2,000 years. And here we're talking about 1,500 to 2,000 years and nothing changes. So I think that was either just a glaring flaw in the world building or just an inherent flaw because like I said to me, God Emperor is an essay masquerading as fiction. So Frank Herbert kind of dropped the ball there on world building. And then you get to Heretics in Chapter House and the world opens up a lot more. But I had a very strange feeling reading those two books because at the same time I had the sense that the world was opening up because you have the scattering and the people of the scattering coming back. But at the same time, since the pacing was wonky, the plot was a bit bare bones, I felt like there was a lot missing, that there was the potential to explore so much more of the Doomverse, but you didn't actually get it on the page. And it was so incredibly disappointing, I had a sensation of void, of absence that was quite sharp. I couldn't really do anything about it. I mean, you do focus in on the Bene Gesserit, so you get to see how they function and their home planet. You do get a lot about the Tleilaxu and more about their religion, their culture, what they did to their women, etc. But there's a dissonance between what you're expecting the world to be described as and the way the world should be explored and the way it actually is described, presented, explored on the page. Now, most of my quibbles with the world building throughout the Dune series was that I felt that Frank Herbert kind of struggled when it came to the harder scientific elements of his science fiction or science fantasy. As I say this, this is perhaps why a lot of people consider it science fantasy more than science fiction proper. I think he did brilliantly with like the social science aspect of the science fiction and well, a lot of feminist science fiction writers have done brilliantly in that domain as well. But at times I felt like it wasn't quite good enough for Frank Herbert to just perfect in his softer science fiction and he just had to push with his harder science fiction but he didn't really do it quite well enough I guess. I already mentioned that I had a massive issue with the way he treated genetics and Darwinian evolution that just got so fucked up by the time you get to heretics. Like I said, he broke genetics there. There's just no way you still have clearly defined Atreides lines after 5,000 years. That's just not how it works. The whole thing about prescience was interesting. At times, though, I felt it was slightly uncommitted to in a weird way, and that he didn't really explore it in a satisfactory way. He presents it, it's a definite thread of storytelling in the first Dune trilogy, and then it's kind of just there, and you have multiple possible futures, but then there's only one possible future and way of ensuring humanity survives. And linked to that, the fucking golden path, if any, I don't want to talk about the golden path, I have no good things to say about the golden path. Honestly, even after reading the six books, I'm not even sure I entirely get what the golden path was supposed to be. That was not explained well at all. Again, it's supposed to justify all the horrible things that happened, and I'm like, what the hell is the golden path supposed to be made? Just 
just come out and say it clearly, please, because I'm sick and tired of this shit. So the golden path, I guess presumably it was about breeding people who were invisible to prescience, something like that, or it was the one path that would ensure human beings would scatter in the universe and thus never go extinct. But I'm like, yeah, that's weak teammate. I'm sorry. It's not good enough. It's not well realized at all. I just sod off the golden path. I just, I can't. On a more positive note, I did find the concept of other memories or genetic memories very interesting, though having read about them now in Children of Time, and I had read about them in other books, I guess I'm not the biggest fan of the idea because it really does have to be developed flawlessly or near enough to it for me to be happy with it. But still, it's a neat idea. It wasn't always executed that well once again because there's this whole thing that men can access the genetic memories from both the male and female line and females can only access the female line, but I'm like, women get an X chromosome from their fathers. So so they should at least access their father's memories and then their paternal grandmother's memories, etc. So there would be limitations on both sexes in that regard. So I guess you didn't really think it through that much with the whole Kwisatz Harak thing. But okay, and then there were flaws with that particular concept in God Emperor. And then one thing that bugged me is that out of the blue, he introduces the idea that Bernie Jesuit can just transfer memories from head to head before they die. And there's no context whatsoever given to that. It just happens and you're just supposed to take it at face value. And I'm like, what was that? <laughs> they transmit brain waves? Is it like <laughs> thought osmosis or what? I mean, okay, I guess it's neat, but nothing to support it. So like, okay, whatever. Honestly, I'd say the best idea in the Duneverse, or I mean, let me rephrase, the scientific idea that was executed the best, I think was the absence of AI in the Duneverse and the consequences that that had on human technological progress and human evolution. Because since humans had to do away with AI, I mean, there was Butlerian Jihad and it became a religious thing, total prohibition of intelligent machines, then humans had to modify their own biologies to compensate for that lack of technological aid. That's how you get the guild navigators, which like I said, kind of look like big blobs of flesh with fins and float around in melange gas. Then you've got the Tleilaxu doing their own shit with genetic engineering. You've got the Bene Gesserit who have honed these superhuman capacities with thought and with muscle control and messing about with their homeostasis and things like that. And prescience and cultivating prescience throughout the lineages or the fact that you can evade prescience from the time of C Fiona onwards and things like that. And that was really brilliant because oftentimes a lot of science fiction does focus heavily on technology, the abuses of technology, especially artificial intelligence and the threats it might possibly pose. And here AI was wiped out by a jihad. So humans had to find other ways of being highly technologically advanced. It also kind of means that Frank Herbert didn't really have to bother with like alien species true aliens because he kind of alienizes different types of human beings like the Bene Gesserit, the Bene Tleilax, the Guild Navigators. I mean, they're still technically homo sapiens, but they're becoming something else ultimately. So yeah, I like that. And my final little quibble, it's a very minor quibble, but it's who I am. I wanted more biology on the sandwich. I didn't get enough of it. I wanted more <laughs> info, concrete info on the life cycle of the sad worms, their reproductive processes, their biological processes. I don't know, their evolutionary history, things like that. That was the biology nerd in me. I just wanted more on the sad worms. Otherwise, the sad worms were very cool and are essential to <laughs> the Duneverse, but yeah, I wanted more. All in all, I shall repeat that reading the Dune Chronicles has been the most inconsistently enjoyable and unenjoyable reading experience I've ever had. Never had that with any other novel series, whether SFF or not. It was quite strange. It was quite an adventure, I will definitely say that. Ultimately, I'm very happy I did it. I am happy I have these novels under my belt, as I like to say. In the end, I think I would rate the first Doom trilogy at somewhere between an 8 and an 8.5 out of 10. I do think those books are brilliant. They have 
deep layered theming, brilliant ecological world building and cultural world building with Fremen, especially on Arrakis. And it does explore brilliantly the idea that messianic figures, charismatic leaders are inherently, I'm not sure I quite believe that, but more often than not, even if they start out with good intentions, it will get fucked, basically, to put it bluntly. God Emperor of Dune was definitely my least favorite of the six. It stands between a 4.5 and a 5 out of 10. That's just how it is. It really pissed me off more than anything else and bored me too a bit. Some people love it and feel it's their favorite. I'm one of those who hated it. I hate it's a bit strong, but I strongly disliked it and felt it was the weakest of the series. And finally, you have Heretics and Chapter House Dune. Heretics I would put at a 6 out of 10, and Chapter House I would put at a 6.5 out of 10. They were decent. I wish we'd had the third book in that second trilogy, but that just never happened and never will happen. It really felt like it should have been a grand tale, a grand continuation of what started in the very first Dune book, and somehow it felt empty and felt flat. So much untapped potential in the way I felt. So yeah, that was too bad. Overall, I do think and agree with most people on this that the Dune Chronicles are great works of science fiction. They are an epic tale. I would place it in epic science fiction or epic science fantasy if you want, sure. And there's definitely an aura of, well, ironically enough, charisma to it. There's something there that is magnetic and pulls you in, or at least it pulled me in, which is why also I was so disappointed by God Emperor of Dune and then let down by Heretics and Chapter House because the first three books were amazing. But it definitely deserves its spot among the classics of SFF literature, no doubt about that, especially the the first trilogy. I don't know if many people have touched upon this, but I feel it's actually quite um, grim dark in a way. I don't know if grim dark science fiction is a thing as such, but there is something fairly nihilistic overall about the Doom Chronicles. It's a very bleak view of humanity, or at least partially, and of the future. I mean, future civilization is feudal. <laughs> That's a pretty major step backwards. And you've got a lot of very ethically questionable people doing very ethically questionable things, notably the Bene Gesserit, even though I guess they're supposed to be the good guys. In fact, their name, I checked this out, I felt like it sounded Latin. It is straight up Latin. It means the good doers. And I just burst out laughing when I read that out. I was like, the good doers, they're the good doers. So who are the evil doers? The Mali Gesserit. I guess the Honored Matries was supposed to be the Mali Gesserit, right? So yes, it's quite dark. I wouldn't say it's quite as nihilistic as uh, the works I've read by James Stipfrey Jr., but it, it is quite dark and bleak, actually. I don't know if it ultimately reaches towards a hopeful message. There are hopeful aspects to it, especially in the passages about spiritual things. But yeah, it's quite a it's quite a dark tale overall. The Dune Chronicles was quite a ride. I'm happy I stuck to it and saw it through, and now I am done. So on that note, I hope you enjoyed my series review for the Dune Chronicles. Finally, after all this time, you found it informative. Please do share your thoughts in the comments down below. Hope you all have a lovely day, evening, or whichever time of day you prefer. Take good care of yourselves, and I shall see you in the next video. Bye-bye!